Welcome to the Edge Rowing Podcast. Today, I'm very lucky to be able to say that we've got Alex Wolf, one of the world's best strength and conditioning coaches. We cover all the areas strength and conditioning within rowing. We go into a very detailed explanation into the why behind strength training and really breaking it down to the fundamentals for rowing <clears throat> and what you know you as an athlete should be looking for when you're doing your strength training and, and you know explaining it in a way that you can really understand um, the movements that you should be doing in the gym. We cover a lot of the most important stuff, which is mindset, and we we had a really fascinating insight into the mindset behind not just strength training, but you know, being in a team and being working with other people, whether you're coaches or an athlete and a coach or athlete to athlete. Um, as well as we always try and um, go into some specifics on what you can take away. We do get a bit advanced sometimes with the the kind of language that gets used and um, the concepts. So I'll, I'll provide um, some definitions in the description below uh, of some of the terms, just in case you haven't heard them before. But if you find your mind drifting, don't worry. Um, we always try and bring it back in and kind of go back to it in a sort of simpler way. But anyways, I'll play the recording. Before you get going, as always, um, like, subscribe. If you're on Spotify, make sure you, that you follow the channel. And if you find it valuable, please do share it with anyone else you think would enjoy it. Cheers. So welcome everybody to the Edge Rowing Podcast. Really excited today for um, our guest, Alex Wolf. Um, super, super knowledgeable. Um, again, a, a world leader, in my opinion, in strength and conditioning, uh, and even more so in rowing. He's the co-founder of Science of Rowing. Uh, the co-founder of the SNC Academy, uh, he's former GB rowing strength and conditioning coach, worked his way up um, to being the head of the um, strength and conditioning for the EIS, which the EIS is basically um, the UK Olympic um, sports program, and then also the the head of learning. So um, <clears throat> not just really knowledgeable in strength and conditioning, but also really knowledgeable in teaching and coaching people as well, which is um, kind of the two areas that I'd really like to cover today um but yeah alex really excited to have you here thank you thank you very much for um inviting me and, and for such a generous introduction <laughs> yeah of course of course um so yeah alex like i think it's always really good to understand um how did you get involved started getting involved in sport uh, and then how did you find yourself kind of heading down the path of um strength and conditioning yeah you're, you're making me really recall back 25 odd years ago but strength and conditioning didn't exist when I went to university so that was back okay. in the early early thousands so 99 to 2002 it was just it was called fitness coaching and where I got to I was I loved sprinting and I loved playing rugby um and up to the age of about 16 I thought I was always going to make it as a an international player and realized very quickly that I wasn't good enough at either and when you turn up to a school schoolboy national championships in um sprinting and you run a pb and you're still being beaten by 0. 0.6 0. 0.7 of a second you realize that you're, mm. that's definitely not not the root way for you so i ended up um realizing i wanted to do something in, in sport and i didn't mm. really know what to do and i thought i wanted to do physiotherapy but knew i wasn't going to get the grades to get into physiotherapy so i en ended up doing a human biology and sports science degree at uh, st mary's university in twickenham and that really opened my eyes up to what we now call strength conditioning but back then was just fitness training and, and you know picked up a few few sports and individuals at tennis clubs and swimming clubs and mm. golfers and, and so on and and then started coaching some of the rugby players at the at the university and, and had my own business as a personal trainer and it got to this point where i had to make a decision because i was also employed by richmond count uh richmond uh council which was look, leading their um exercise referral so anyone who was who who found that exercise was going to be a way to help them overcome things like um or support their, their health around angina or previous stroke or heart attack victims uh, things like that yeah. i had a choice to either go more down that route or more into the into the fit into the kind of the, the performance side so i decided to go down the performance side and then what was it that made you want to go down the performance side that's a good question i, I if i'm being honest it was fulfillment uh, while I really enjoyed the um, the exercise referral, one of the things I, I I found was that the compliance was very low, and it didn't matter almost yeah. what you did. <clears throat> like it, it it was really short lived. So everyone you, you came through was a twelve week program, and yeah. you didn't see them again if because they didn't have to. Some of them would. That's really unfair. 
a number of them would come back and you would see them for long periods of time but you didn't really see 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 what was going on um and it was an if i'm being really honest it was a, not an easy job but it was a comfortable job like i turn up to work turn up at nine o'clock in the morning you know friday at five o'clock i'm done nothing more where the exercise and the for for performance piece was it was a little bit more chaotic and a little bit more thoughtful in that you had to really think about what they're trying to do and, and back then there wasn't any level of the education and support where it was so did you see now. sort of like a gap did you see sort of a gap in potential within strength and conditioning there that maybe wasn't wasn't there yeah yeah so i got temper all of this because back then the internet wasn't what it was was back then yeah. as it is now so there wasn't that, that really available information that you get so you don't have this huge volume of people doing it and but there were some very well-known people like Raf, Raf Brandon um uh, Nick Grantham Tommy Yule who were all kind of were known in the area and were people who were probably paid for this already so but there wasn't it wasn't really really that that much of it going on so I thought there was an opportunity opportunity there um, so I, I started just kind of finding opportunities to practice this more and more. And then I went off to do a master's degree in biomechanics and that in, introduced me to more of an idea around movement, right, which I'd never really thought about. And it was at that point there, the English Institute of Sport, which is now the UK Sports Institute, were running its first cohort of internships. And that's what I applied for up in Sheffield. Right. Um, and I was really sucks, really lucky. So and just to sucks. actually quickly go back there, um, what was so that seemed like a bit of a change then you when you started to think about movements rather than what was the alternative? What was the kind of original thinking of um, strength training? Yeah. So I, I don't think not necessarily around strength training, but general athletic right. movement and athletic being all athletes, not just athletics. And it was very much around um mostly around a physiological approach which i had looked at but the the degree really made me focus on two things which is basically kinetics kinematics movement and force and it made me really consider what the demands of athletic movement was both from a from a movement perspective and what the the, the kind of the fundamental forces which are required to to achieve that which is basically where a load of my thinking comes from now so when people start talking okay. to me about outcome of training the bit i'll always come back to and we'll get onto this when we talk specifically about rowing and strength training it comes back to well how much force does an individual actually produce while rowing um and what's their kind of what do they need to be able to achieve within the weight room to actually develop that even further and if there's a mismatch between that then we have to really understand the mechan mechanical output that that we're trying to change because without that understanding of mechanical output we're just doing strength training to do something but we're not clear what we're trying to try and do that so it really made me think about like give me a really good example because i was working with javelin at the time when a javelin thrower releases the javelin they're producing maybe two and a half times to three times body weight through their shoulder so if you're a 90 wow. kilo javelin thrower you know that's 180 to 270 kilos of load going through the shoulder okay wow. just for a quick reference then like how much would be going through say a rowing stroke through your shoulder just for us rowing audio the rowing uh, less maybe across both shoulders combined would be maybe a body weight and a body weight and a half okay um, so, a so you're looking at point about about 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.75 per shoulder so which is why when you're looking at strength training for rowing uh, for the upper body like bench pull bench press then you you you, know, you can't get away as a as a ninety kilo male bench pressing or bench pulling eighty kilos. It's just not good enough. Um, and that maybe that's why I didn't demand. make it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't I can't comment on that. I don't know enough. But, uh, um, bench but, press wasn't my strength, but we'll leave it at that. But anyway, sorry, I kind of went on a tangent there. The javelin thrower, the the peak force, yeah. their, sh their shoulder. So, so when you look, so when you look at it from that point of view. When you're saying that the shoulder goes from maybe 270 kilos worth of load while it's decelerating, well, then you've got to kind of look at well, what does strength training? Where in the strength training program does 270 kilos exist? Yeah, it does. So like okay. it may it might only be instantaneous for that that moment, but it's a really high force that the shoulder has to has to go through. So then you have to think about well, where do we? How do we help that shoulder? One, prevent itself from being injured, and two, actually being able to contribute to the performance even further so those are the kind of things that those, those are the kind of questions that i 
I started working and then working through. And if you go back one step from that is that you don't throw the shoulder, you throw with the hips. So the hips and the trunk contribute about 80% of the, the force required to throw the javelin. The shoulder produces the last 20%. So actually, while you see the throwing of the shoulder, throwing the javelin through the shoulder, it was like, well, okay, we're going to do that through that. We need to get the hips and the trunk working. Putting that into the rowing stroke, what you see is the finish with the, the, the handle coming up into your chest. But the vast majority of force production comes from the um, catch to mid to... Um, uh, maximal handle force that's where the largest amount of force is and everything else then is a is a is a result of what force you produce at that point there so it's like if you know what that is and you know how far how much force you need to be need to be producing to produce a certain boat speed then you can get a sense of just how important the legs are how much the trunks are involved and how much the, the, the arms are involved so i always look at it from that perspective and that was why that that became a really important part of my my education and learning at that stage Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've got loads of questions there, but I'll maybe s save them for later about, um, yeah, the, the rowing side of it. Okay. So uh, what I really liked as well, the way you're talking about it is being, it sounds just like you're being very in the moment and, and being very good at sort of ignoring perhaps like what were prior, yeah, understandings of like what you should do for a javelin thrower and being very in the moment. And I think it kind of applies to like technique as well and like mindset or a training program. Like, what are you actually trying to get out of a session? What are you trying to actually get out of the sport? So, um, it's quite cool to to hear you talk about it and and all your content as well. I, I like the way that you talk about that stuff. Okay, so then, um, what was the sort of next steps for you as you you started to dive into this stuff? Yeah, so I, I ended up having an internship up in Sheffield for a year, um, where, which is where I really made probably all of my mistakes in, in terms of I, I was young enough to think I knew everything um, and very yeah. quickly got to what age were you? Of that, about 24, I think. Oh, okay. 23, 24. Um, and, you know, I thought I was a, yeah, I thought I was bigger than I really was. And then Tommy Yule was my line manager. So those who don't know Tommy, he's um works with british athletics he's a multi-medal winning commonwealth athlete in weightlifting okay which was another another education around just what i didn't know um and i worked with hundreds of athletes during that time across probably every olympic and winter olympic paralympic and winter paralympic sport there was over that there was a one year intern and two years of, of additional time up there where i just got to write programs for hundreds of athletes different sports and I really learned that kind of variation in in the differences across across the sports and then in 2007 I moved down to was it 2007? 2006 I moved down to London uh, to work with UK Athletics and then at Lee Valley which was where one of the sprint centers were so I I got a real experience of working with some very very um, experienced and fast sprinters, some of the fastest that Britain have ever produced. And so that gave me another real huge experience. And that was when I started actually coaching javelin as I had my own javelin group as well, um, and uh, seated throws, so Paralympic throwers as well. So I was doing a lot of lot of coaching during, during that time. So I, I learned an awful lot just around the physical requirement to move your body really blooming quickly. Um, and with the throwers I worked with, that was probably the f one of the only times I've worked with strong people and got them really strong. So people talk okay. about strength and you know, rowing strength. Like I've had, you know, rowers who've squatted maybe 180, 190 kilos and might have deadlifted 200 kilos. These guys were, you know, squatting up to 300 kilos. They were um, snatching. Yeah, but what's uh, their 2K? <laughs> your bench press um, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um, no comment so, moving yeah. on <laughs> but that that was that's what i mean like we get, most people when they're doing strength training do not get the opportunity to work with strong people and and have the opportunity to get them stronger you often get people who are reasonably strong and they will make strength gains regardless to a certain degree but to get someone who's already really strong even stronger there's a real there's a real uh, fine art opportunity to do that and I, I was lucky enough to lucky enough to do that wow. so it was incredible I'm sure incredible there was a lot of that. your effort going like how did you go about <clears throat> again maybe a bit of a tangent here but how did you go about 
um, getting selected into these, these big opportunities? Like, was there anything you were diff doing differently compared to other applicants? Um, I think the biggest thing for me was um, I was really consistent in my principles, I think, around what, what, what mattered and what didn't matter. So some of it was about being really clear on outcome. What are we trying to change? And the other bit was what are the, what are the conditions we need to create to um, uh, establish that change? So if you're looking at maximal force, there are conditions which are universally applied to every individual on earth because all humans are humans and they all have phys physiology. And, and so we just worked out what that, what that was. So I was really able to articulate that, but also train, organized training and all and write training programs which really went after those 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 outcomes but probably the biggest thing was the non-technical side was like and you'll see this within you know crew boats and coaches is is the um is the the um the, 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 what am i trying to say the kind of the emotional intelligence and the kind of the, the the ability to connect with other people work with other people and the bit i'll always come back to doesn't matter how good your program is if your athlete doesn't uh do the program in the way you want it to be or you haven't or, or you can't create the conditions for them to to do that the program will always fall short and mm -hmm. most of that isn't about what's written on a piece of paper it's all about how they are connected that the, the athlete is connected to the program the relationship you have with that individual and their clarity of understanding yeah why they're doing what they're doing and the amount of coaches i've worked with strength coaches and sports coaches that just fall short on that kind of that emotional intelligence piece is that you can have a really bad program, but if the, the athletes believe it's the best program and they, and they deliver hundred percent, they will make massive gains because yeah. they have trust and belief in what, what they're doing. And that was the other bit is that, you know, we, we were, I was really able to articulate this and work really well with coaches to say, like, these are the things I think will genuinely support you connect the athletes to that and then provide the environment for, for the athletes to genuinely excel within those environments. And that's primarily why I got employed and all the roles that I did. And then, uh, and particularly within rowing, my, my, my time in rowing was very much around creating environments for athletes. So the rowers there to do things that they've never done before. That, yeah. Um, so interesting. That, okay. One, again, I know we're trying to stay, there's just so many like gems. I think you, you have Alex, like what, uh, maybe just one tip of uh, a new rowing coach or um, strength coach or whatever that's looking to increase the yeah the emotional intelligence I guess behind the, their connection with their athletes and likewise I think what's really cool is obviously it tra it'll transfer into work and jobs or whatever sort of team environments you're involved in. Yeah, uh, one is difficult, but yeah. the one I would. I would I would go to is ask questions to seek understanding rather than to answer rather than to give an answer and the okay. reason I, I say that like a is, doctor kind of isn't it it's kind of like your your GP yeah, it's, yeah you keep asking questions and you know, there's a there's an art to asking a question and not sounding like a right dick being asking question after question but asking questions to seek greater understanding means that you understand where the from a coaching perspective understand what the coach's philosophy is and why they believe the, what what they believe and then that gives you real insights like okay they're not gonna i can't come to them and say this is how we're going to do strength training i need to just do this it's like well how does my strength training align to what you what you're doing and how can i make that better from an athlete perspective and this is the biggest thing when i was working in the rowing program was with the coaches that were working with strength coaches that were working with me it's like you need to understand the athletes and mm -hmm. one of the big things is if you do not understand their their hopes their fears their stresses the things that are going to stop them and the things that are going to enable them to be brilliant then all you're delivering is a, a one hour two hour session on them three times a week and they're going to come in go out and you know it's just another training session you're understanding what you know where that where the the challenges are with them and the things that are going on in their life you get to you get to have these discussions which can really inform how you might coach them and you know one of my one of my opening um sessions with the the open weight men many years ago one of the rowers um uh, ex-military um was doing chin-ups and i shouted across the gym to him while, he, while he's doing chin. uh yeah it, it was yeah um and he um 
I shouted across the room to him and said, oh, lock your arms out, lock your arms out. He came over to me, really angry with me, and said, I don't want to be shouted at in the gym. And rightly so. He's like, if you've got something to say to me, come up to me and come and say it. And I didn't take time to know him and what he needed to, what he needed in, in the weight room. So after that, I asked him a question. And this is, I suppose, the second bit, bit of um, advice. And this is um, from Richard Chambers was um how do you want to be coached because i was you know, whooping and hollering while they were peeping on the power cleans or whatever it was and he was like you know we're not we're only training we're not even doing personal best we're just training where are you going to go with this whooping and hollering once we do do something really great like you've, you've, you've given it all so like where are you going to go i was like well, okay well how do you want to be coached he's like i just want you to come up to me put my hand on my shoulder and say good work well done and when i did do something really special or we're about to do something special that's when you do that so people often don't ask the question of how people want to be coached um because it seems quite of not necessarily intuitive to do because you're you yeah. know you're the all-seeing person there so pete really taught me understand the person and understand how they want to be coached understand how do they want to be communicated rich chambers taught me how to um uh, ask every athlete how they want to be coached and then you try and build your build your coaching strategies around that and when you have a group of 30 athletes in the training room at the same time that's challenging but it's doable and you can definitely work yeah. out how to how, how to um how to do that so those would be my, my my two big things yeah wow and i think this is something i was saying to charlie simpson when we had him on in the last podcast was <clears throat> what was jumping out to me again like world leader super successful knows his stuff but still very much an openness and a willingness to learn and where i've found the worst coaches have been being coached by them and then seeing it are the ones that are like definitive no this is the way this is the culture this is um you need to do this it worked for these people before it will work for you if it doesn't work then that's your fault um i think it's really co cool to see you talking about having that flexibility and adaptability for for the person um <clears throat> Okay, so do you feel like that is maybe kind of what separated you then as a coach, like not just your knowledge and your understanding of being in the moment with the movement, but then also that relationship side of it? Is that kind of maybe what got you into the to the GB team? Yeah, I think so. Um, the 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 understanding and, and spending time with athletes and coaches is cl clearly had a big a big role in that, and my my. Uh, uh interview process for British Rowing was I look back on that now and I'm like geez that was awful like genuinely awful <laughs> in, in terms of like not not an awful process but awful like I just it was awful for me um as in you did and, badly or like you didn't enjoy the experience I, I, I just didn't enjoy didn't enjoy it so I didn't do very well in the in the interview itself um but I did enough for them to think okay it's probably good enough to do something we're going to ask him to come in and spend a few weeks with us to um spend time with the coaches spend time with the athletes and that's where i i think i excelled is because i was able to spend time with the coaches spend time with the athletes the feedback was going to be positive because i've just had you know the equivalent of two weeks worth of time with them delivering sessions you know understanding what's going on learning to grow and genuinely immersing myself in the sport and I think that was why I didn't enjoy it because it was, you know, it's coaching with consequence, I suppose is the best way to describe it. Like if I didn't do very well, I wasn't going to get the job. Whereas when you're in the job, you, you know, there's still a consequence, but the, the consequences is that you might get told off, but you still get a, a paycheck at the end of the month where, where the consequence of that was I'd, I'd just be made redundant from British athletics. Um, Cause they're going through a massive overhaul and change. And I'd, I applied for that role prior to be made redundant, but then the pressure was on for me to actually um, get that job. So that's why I didn't enjoy it. But what it what it showed to the sport and it showed to everyone else that I was capable of doing it. So by the time I got into that first kind of full season, I'd already done a number of weeks for them, and and you know, I wasn't a new face trying to change everything um, in those early days. I, I did eventually change quite a lot, but like it it, it was it was a stable hands and they knew what they were getting. And I think that was, that was, it, it was about building good relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was it like for making the first impressions then and, and trying to have an impact quite quickly, what do you think you did that, that kind of 
secured your role then was was that the relationship side of it do you think it, it was it was the relationships it was also quite a volatile environment as well um was it oh four that you came in uh oh eight oh wait so, oh, okay, oh, okay. um oh eight oh nine i can't remember exactly when it was now um but they but it was it was volatile in that there was quite a large number of staff turnover in from a strength coach point of view okay the strength program had been taken control of by the by paul thompson at the time uh because he lost trust within what was going on previously and then to get that back you're gonna have to demonstrate a, a significant amount of um, trust in, in 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 that space um the men's program uh, jürgen only had um, I kind of joke about this, but I only had two kind of requirements. Like, you know, what, what, how how can I support the program? I, I want um, strong rowers. Um, anything else? Yes. What's that? I want big and strong rowers. I'm like, okay, so like, it gave me like a mandate just to go after it, um, and that's exactly exactly what we did. But the the, the, the Paul and I talk about this uh, quite quite a lot. But our that early days with him was was challenging because he'd had a, a load of fear from of, of you know, well not fear it was not fear it's like they had a lack of consistency within the training prior to that and i had to demonstrate i knew enough to be able to say actually these are the things that we need to do so there was a lot of relationship building but fundamentally i maintained my principles around what i what i knew so what is the outcome what are the conditions we need to create for that outcome those are the two simple things and if the training didn't match the outcome, then then we had to try and find an alternative way to way to do that. And that was the big discussions I had with Paul was like, look, we really need to, if, if this is your goal, we both agree this is the goal, but the conditions are this, the training program doesn't do that. We need to change it to, to that. And that took a, a kind of few months for him to, to kind of, I suppose, trust me, is it's probably mm -hmm. the best word because I was a snotty little, 27 year old or 28 year old coming into a program which had never been in a rowing boat and you know all the people in rowing are rowing coaches and been rowers themselves and you know i've had a play in the sport for a long time and i've kind of jumped around for five years in different sports and doing this that, and the other and and it worked ultimately like uh tomo and i um i would i would say now we're uh we're close friends we we, we catch up fairly regularly and actually that was all built on that relationship at the very very beginning where we had challenges about kind of our ideas but we we went when, once you got to the point where it's like oh, actually i can genuinely trust alex to do this then i became much more central to his program and much interesting more, uh, um contributing to that program so when we got into the 20 2012 2013 moving into rio cycle one of the things that we were able to do really nicely was we would come together at the beginning of the year and say, okay, let's plan a four years out to Rio. Like, where, where do we want to do things? When do we think we can develop the, the strength qualities that are necessary for the, the program or necessary for the philosophy of the, of the coaches within the program? And we built it. And then it became just, a, you know, we became the inner circle of building the program around that. And I don't think Paul had had that within the British program. He, I think he might have had it in the, in the Aussie program with some of the other, the other staff he's had there. But... I kind of experienced, and maybe I'm, Paul should share this story uh, around what he did or he didn't, but it felt like this was a time where he could really trust the people around him. They'd been there long enough. There was a there was a good relationship, and, and the relationship wasn't one of subservience. It was one of support and challenge. And what I mean support is once a decision was made, we supported that, even if it wasn't the idea that we felt it was um, the right way. And we thought there's something else as the kind of major decision maker we're like okay we're going that we we'll go hard on that and we'll support you and externally to everyone else we will we will have a a the party line of what it is but behind closed doors the challenge was that we would challenge each other in that in that group to be able to have these quite open discussions around why we think this might work or why not not work and, and challenge yeah. i don't mean in a kind of aggressive point of view it's just like we have different differing of opinion yeah. but we were able to share that without fear of consequence where that's huge yeah. yeah yeah absolutely and i think from an athlete perspective this kind of co challenging conversations without fear of consequence the consequence is often deselection or being kicked out of a program yeah. or being <clears> marginalized within within the program so that's where I think um, 
we got to within that space. And I'm working with a coach now uh, in the in the Chinese program, Tom K. Very much the same. Like we had these these incredible open conversations around where we are, and we we agree, we disagree, you know. But it's not no animosity or it doesn't affect our relationship it's just like well this is what i think this is what i think well is it going to work i don't know we'll try it we don't, and, and we just we just push it out together and and that trickles down really, doesn't it as well like not just yeah. from, from the top like they say the fish rots from the head so the opposite as well so maybe if the the rowers are seeing that there's a a bit more of a kind of open culture around that then you know it's also like i'm, I'm just thinking about from rowers perspective here like what could they take home and certainly if you're in a crew or if you're in an environment or also if you're working with a coach then you know having that trust in each other to yeah like you say no consequences to getting it wrong is um is is so valuable yeah and, and i think a lot of people talk about that as psychological safety and psychological safety i think is being mis misplaced slightly it's not about feeling safe in its in isolation it's about having the opportunity to challenge in in a safe environment knowing that the environment that you're in and the people within that environment aren't necessarily judgmental and aren't going to penalize you for sharing sharing that and that that for me is where safety really comes into it's not just like it's uh, it feels all right i'm not you know there's a there's well-being stuff going on here it's much deeper than that it's, it's the ability to create a culture or an environment where the opportunity to freely share and freely explore and debate about um, the things that are important are freely shared and debated, and that whatever decision is made is agreed, even if it's not necessarily the the, the decision that you 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 wanted. And I think that's that's the the important bit that you included in the decision making, and you're clear why that decision is being made, regardless of whether or not it is the, the, the decision you 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 would make. So, so I think there's a there's a really powerful bit in there from from a, a support team of coaches mm -hmm. and medical and and fitness staff, as well as there is crew coaches with their crews themselves or in, in any coaching environment. Like it's that's when it's done well, you can sit back and you can allow people to discuss and they come to their own their own conclusions and often solve the problem without you ever having to contribute, which is that's that's powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lo I love hearing about all that stuff. I'm I'm super passionate about. Um, creating those environments, whether it's just a, a one coach and one athlete, but yeah, even more so in a team. Um, just a quick question, actually, like one thing that was quite um, influential in influential on me when I was um, an aspirational rower, I, I read this article about Alex Gregory, how after Beijing, he really focused on strength and conditioning and dropped his 2K scores. Did he work? Was he working with you at the time? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. I, I would like to just go into that a little bit. But basically, for those that don't know, Alex Gregory, he was a spare in Beijing. Um, and he had a good long, hard look at, him, at himself and his weaknesses and found that strength was his weak area. So um, yeah, Alex, it'd be cool if actually you could just talk that through then if it was kind of if you were working with him, because basically the result of it was Alex went from spare to, I think, like top stroke cider and took a load of time off his 2k. And then maybe the, some of the specifics on like how because you, we, I get a lot of questions from rowers that maybe have good endurance or technique, but their strength isn't there. So I'm sure there's a lot of specifics in what other people could could do to to make a similar improvement that Alex did. Yeah, so I think there's, there's two major things with it. One is strength training is a skill. So the more you do of it, the better you become at it. So you need to give give it the space to be able to uh, be completed within a training program. And that sounds really obvious and so on, but when you've got such a high volume of rowing training that sits up, sits around it, there has to be a, there has to be a focus on that. The second bit is around um, muscle mass. The more muscle mass you have, the greater the potential you will, you will have to be able to produce more force. So, but to do that, you need more time to strength train. So one of the things, um alex and then i suppose the third thing is probably worth noting he already committed to a mindset of i need to be stronger now that's yeah. another, when you've got someone who's already got a mindset on that that's a that's a lot easier just to put anything in front of them and they will they will thrive in it versus somebody who's like oh, i don't really want to do that and they'll clearly rowers i've worked with who are like you know three or four sessions that we do of this a week are just four of the 17 i need to get done and yeah four, three of the 17 
get done. They're worried about Where the I next can... session and how sore their legs might be for yeah. the 30 rate 20 tomorrow or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and unlike rowing or on the ergometer, so if you look at the the very best ergometer time versus the very worst ergometer time in the in the men's or the women's squad, you know, you haven't got this massive spectrum. It's quite a narrow spectrum between yeah. the best and the worst. It's quite narrow. In the weight room, it's massive. Right? So yeah. you could be... Like a Pete Reed, for instance, on bench press was a one fifty five ish or whatever it was, and then he 155. had somebody down the other. Yeah, he, he was a monster. Holy um, shit! I, I, and I cannot take any credit for that because I'm sure he was on that way before I was do, doing anything. But then you had other people down at the other end who were struggling at seventy or eighty kilos. So that's a mm. that's a. That, <laughs> but that, that kind of, that's what I mean. That's where there's such diversity in, in, yeah. in the performances there so there's no hiding space and um, no hiding place in the gym like it, it shows how strong you are or how how weak you are um so what alex was alex had the mindset so i could just give him training and he'd, he'd get it get it done and he because he had the mindset he was willing to push himself hard in those sessions and the people that were good at strength training had that mindset already there's people like sam townsend and bill lucas um I'm not gonna, they're not the only two, but they were the two that kind of jump out to me. Pete Reed as well, who who just excelled in that space. Um, and then they just they just trained. They didn't necessarily have to. I don't want to say work hard. They gave the intensity, knowing that the cost of that intensity wouldn't necessarily affect them in the rest of the, the rest of the training. People like Alex would then work as hard as them, but would have a cost to that. So that would obviously filter down into it because he's not wasn't as skilled as them um, in the early days. But as he moved through, he was able to give the, that same level of intensity without fear of it being a negative impact on him in the um, in the latter latter parts of the of the of the training week. And and the compound effect of strength training is massive. So if you only do you know, one session a week for 48 weeks, you might get some progress. In the early days, you probably will. You do three sessions a week for I don't know 160 weeks over a four-year cycle. Like you get a, a really big compound effect of that, and that's but that requires somebody to deliberately go in and try and make change. And you know, you know, so when you talk about me, you know, my training program was is only as good as how well Alex Gregory delivered that, and his intention was incredible. So he just went and go and delivered it, and because of that, he was able to make the changes that were 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 required. And you know, he wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was right at the very top of that but he definitely was way above the um the midpoint of where where his performances were um and he moved the other things he moved beautifully as well in the weight room so he had really good hips which allowed him to get into decent squat positions allowed to get him into um which allowed him to load more effectively so he, ha- he just had he, he was um right mindset <laughs> good by bi- biomechanical movement in in the first place um, and a training program which allowed him to generally express those those force characteristics, and he did shift shift his way up, and so he was he was very good. Mm. Yeah, and what I I really like about what you're saying is the majority of what you're talking about the the difference makers in in the weight in the weight room is yeah. is the mindset and is the the approach to it rather than you know you haven't even mentioned once you know well what we did differently with Alex was we did four sets instead of three sets of back squats. Um, which is where I think a lot of people get caught up on because it's a bit more quantifiable and um, easier to just say, well, that's the difference. I don't actually know how many sets I should be doing or how many reps I should be doing on a lift. It's the harder questions that people are afraid to ask themselves is, is my mindset right going into this, which I, it's really yeah. cool to, to hear this. Um, yeah. That being there's, so, there's yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, um, that it would like what were the specifics on, on how you approached um alex's strength plan to to get the progress and so it wasn't in all honesty it wasn't it wasn't different to the rest of the training program okay. so there were there were there was across the men's women's lightweights and under 23s i, I probably wrote between 90 and 120 strength pro, training programs and then they got kind of bunched into into certain groups so if you needed a certain area to develop then you you probably would be in a, a group of of, of of athletes and you might might have had like 15 different groups of, of athletes to work with so alex would have sat in an area which was generally needed to be 
uh, lower body and upper body needs to, needs, needs to improve. So you might have had somebody who just needed lower body to improve or somebody who just needed upper body to improve, but he would have, had, he would have been both. Now, the big, the big bit around, around the training for him, like he wouldn't have been different to the other people within that group, but the focus was around putting them with people. Again, this is another, another area around, not about the exercise program, but about how you organize training. You put people in groups together where, they're going to challenge each other. They mm. don't know unless you know they're going to challenge each other. But, you know, you put someone like Alex with another athlete who's fairly similar to them, um, and you end up, they end up inadvertently trying to just push a little bit above, you know, you know what rows are like, you know, if someone's doing a split here, they just want to go half a split quicker. Yeah. Just, you know, for no reason, just to, just to kind of needle them a little bit. And that's what would happen in, in, in the weight room as well. They'd just go a little bit heavier. And, and that was enough to create motivational change within that group because that would then, they knew that they had people that they were quite competitive with. Now, if you put somebody who was, you know, like a 110 kilo back squat with a 160 kilo back squat, the 160 kilos get, get no chase from the 110 because they're so far apart and the one who's at 110 is like well i can't put 50 kilos on my back squat but you put 110 with 112 back squatter at the same uh, all training together well actually two and a half kilos is you know flipping the coin in terms of who's actually stronger really like and you start seeing them moving together and, and you can you can pace them so on average over the olympiad or year on year during that olympiad um we had about a 25 percent improvement across all our strength measures over the Olympiad, it was um, from from year one to year four, we had just under a thirty percent improvement in the, the force, strength, and power characteristics. Oh, really? And the reason we were were you able to correlate that, that to ERG scores as well? I guess it's hard when you, you're doing all the training, but is there any sort of direct correlation you're able to? Correlate? Yeah, yeah, there is. There, there was some really significant factors which um correlated to, to our performance so for the men's program the single biggest differentiator so I, I took all of the data so 5k 2k 250 um uh, power strokes 30 minutes uh step test scores all the strength test data put it all into a into a, into a um uh into a stats program and the single biggest differentiator on 2k men's 2k ergo performance was um uh lower body and bench pull performance it was nothing to do with the uh, any of the uh, ergo scores or any of the uh, uh, physiological bits and that goes back to that bit we got this really big differentiation between strength training and a really small differentiation between ergo performances so the only differentiator you could get in that really kind of close group was their strength scores so basically that told you that the guys that had the strongest legs and the biggest bench pull were the guys that were could that could row um, the fastest 2k performance in the women's program how much mean power you produced on a counter movement jump so um, for those who don't know you're on a set of force plates which are like a weighing scales so expensive weighing scales you have a, a wooden stick across your shoulders and you jump as high as you can and then you one of the variables is how much power you can produce the mean power is how much on the upward action how much power you produce during that time so how much average power you or mean power you produce during that plus how much load you could back squat would account for about um 90 percent of the variation in how fast you could row 250 meters now that became important because how fast you could row 250 meters of the women's program accounted for about 70 percent of your 2000 meter ergo performance so you can suddenly see now that strength has a direct relationship to to um to to um to rowing performance and there's plenty of other research out there which which demonstrates it but and actually i just reviewed an article from 2013 from trent lawton who was a strength coach over in new zealand during the their, their golden era in the, the kind of 20 2009 to 2015 time and the biggest differentiator for selected versus non-selected rowers in the, in the women's sculling program was how much um how strong their legs were like that was a single biggest predictor of of, of um, selection was how strong their legs were so we know that strength isn't going to make the boat row 2000 meters but we do know that they have a contribution to economy um 
the ability to change boat speed and, and, and sprint it towards the end. So all of these things are important. Um, so yes, there are definite relationships around all, all of these um, characteristics. But I always temper that, that that may not be the case for somebody who only row, you know, for a female rower who's rowing seven minutes 34, 2K ergo. It's people that are rowing um, uh, sub seven minute ergos and getting close to the you know, six, six mm. fifties or whatever it might be. And for the men, you're looking at sub six minute ergos in, in, in that sense. Um, and then for the lightweight men, one of the most interesting facts was how much peak power they could produce on a counter movement jump and how much body fat they had on their legs was a direct correlation to how fast they could row um, at 2000 meters. And that was, that was, that accounted for about 80% of the, of the performances as well. Uh, and when I say it accounts for, you can, it will basically does it's a regression analysis. So it basically tells you that the fewest number of variables that predict the most percentage of performance. So if it's saying 60% of the performances accounted for by these two variables, it's basically saying, we can say that uh, 60% of that performance is directly related to gotcha. these variables. The 40% is we don't know. Yeah. It's everything else that accounts for that. So the closer you get to 100%, the more, the more um, that, um, of that, that relationship. So mm -hmm. for the lightweight men, it was around 80%. So you could basically say, you know, for that, that population, really lean legs, really powerful legs, would account for eighty percent of how fast they could or how fast they could row for two thousand okay. meters. Last twenty percent will be technique, physiology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But remember, their physiology is so blooming good already; it's it's just reflective of that group. It wouldn't be reflective of much larger differences across. Interesting. Could you be like? Would you be able to say if you can recall, <clears throat> say for for men, women, lightweight men, lightweight women, like if you could correlate this back squat with a six minute 2k do you, do you know off the top of your head say if you can squat this much and get obviously assuming your physiology is world class then you can produce roughly this 2k score and same for the for the men and the women uh can i do that e yes yes to yeah you can um i don't know i don't know um off the top of my head what it was I, what, what i what i do know for a fact and what helped us in some of our decision making was um we, i could predict how fast somebody could row 250 meters 100 meters based upon back squat and mean power score on the counter movement jump so okay. i could plug in and say okay if your let's say your 100 meter score was I don't know, 17.3 seconds, as a, and you needed to be below 17 seconds to be world class for a female. I could, and I could look at your score, your how much you squatted, how much your mean power was. I could adjust those scores, and I could say, okay, if you could produce this more power and this more back squat, you could row this. You could potentially row it in this time. But not and a top of, off within, the top of your head for like if you can squat your your body weight or so a hundred kilo, you can't, yeah. No, and oh. no, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. Um, and I can't say the the more you squat, the faster you will go, because there's there's a there's a there's this two things. One is one is called allometric scaling. So the heavier you are, uh, and the taller you are, the percentage increase starts to slow down. So if you're, you know, in the, in, when you're light and 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 uh, and light and short, as you get hard, as you as you get taller and heavier, you get this gradual increase in performance but as you get you get to this tipping point where actually you don't get this linear increase anymore it starts to flatten out so right. somebody who weighs 80 kilos to 90 kilos might only make two or three percent difference but someone who weighs 70 kilos compared to an 80 kilos if they move up to 80 kilos would make like a nine percent improvement in performance so it just it, it's 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 all it's all based on based upon that scaling so which basically means if you're 150 kilos and you're rowing, you're not going to make a boat go fast because you're too heavy um, from mm -hmm. that, which is why that scaling becomes really, really important. So you you basically are trying to say there's a, there's a sweet spot for the, the open men and there's a sweet spot for the open women. So if you're within that weight range, you're going to be able to produce, you need to be able to produce X amount of force, which is why often I say for, for the men, you need to you know roughly need about 100 and 
150 to 160 kilo back squat or deadlift for one rep for, women, it's about, for one rep equivalent and for the women it's about 130 to 140 kilos um and if you can if you can do that and you're roughly in the, the weight ranges that you would you would you be in then you know that's good enough now if you're 120 kilos well, i don't think there are many 120 kilos the amount of squat you'd need to produce would be so much higher to get the same level of improvement. So you'd need to put like 190 to 200 kilo back squat. Like that's, you know, and to do that in rowing is you'd have to stop rowing to allow that individual to do that. And you know, they're so yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't happen. So then I can, I can say with a high degree of confidence, if you're a male rower between 85 and 100 kilos ish, 160 to 170 kilos will be good enough for female if you're between 67 and 80 kilos uh one 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 thirty ish is about it's going to be good enough for you yeah and that's that's a simple that's, that's kind of the rate the rate of yeah yeah you just got to squat 150 yeah, kilos or 130 kilos easy <laughs> yeah Off okay cool <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. Generally, could you like, I guess, you know, there might be some confidentiality in terms of like what you can share. So like, um, we can clip this bit out if you prefer, but is there any sort of specifics you can give on kind of what, uh, like strength training, rowing straight Olympic strength training plan, um, you know, that high level looked like in a, as a sort of average week. Yeah. I don't, uh, yeah. I, there isn't any confidentiality on that. I can, I can talk in principle, so I'm not showing any any programs but i'll always go back to whatever i share now is all dependent on how it is organized within the training week and how the athletes perform it so it's 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 it so that there they're going to be the most important factors but in in the winter i would often want strength training if if, if the coach is allowed often want strength training in three to four times a week um and as we move closer towards the competition um, that drops down to probably two to three times from about this time of year through to the first World Cup and through the World Cups through to the Olympics or World Champs, you might do one or two sessions a week. But we'd always say that you cannot leave uh, strength training more than eight days apart. So yeah. you always want to try and get that eight day window. And the reason we say that is a load of the kind of unpublished evidence we've got suggests that you get changes in two things. One, the physiological differences or the physiological change, so you actually get weaker and your ability to produce force um, reduces. The second bit is really around DOMS. We also found that athletes that left strength training too long would get an, an onset of uh, muscle soreness, probably from 10 days on, if there was more than 10 days uh, between, uh, sorry, 10 or more days between sessions. Now that in itself isn't necessarily a performance decrement to strength training, but having muscle soreness, and you'll know it better than me, like having muscle soreness while in a, in a boat has massive consequences on your skill and your technical capability and your ability to work at a high enough intensity to create the physiological responses you need within the boat. So we often made 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 that, um, okay. often, that is one of our rules. In the winter, we tend to go um, a lot heavier in terms of, uh, volume so we go much higher volume and we but we always have one session at least one session a week where there's intense intensity in there um what, what would the to, volume look like um so you'd be looking at any like let's if we take uh like back squat or deadlift you'd be looking at session one might be three sets of ten session two might be four sets of eight session three might be um four or five sets of five and session four would might be five sets of three so you go from high volume at the beginning of the week or at the end of the week and then go moving through down to the intensity or, or vice versa. And the reason we do that is one, the volume, one of the things we're trying to do with, with strength training is, is to change the, the, the size of the muscle, not necessarily the weight of the muscle, but the size of the muscle. So one of the things, the three things we need to do is create metabolic stress, which means the, um, the muscle has to have a degree of uh, anaerobic um, anaerobic uh, respiration in there. So you need to go for like 30 seconds or longer of lifting, which is why everything we do in this time of year is under tempo. So two seconds down, two seconds up. So we remove any kind of stretch reflex or any 
uh, counter movement in that. So it's genuinely muscle contraction that is, is, is doing that. You also need to create um, a mechanical tension. Mechanical tension means that the intensity has to be high enough that for the muscle to be for adaptation of the muscle to occur. If the mechanical tension isn't high enough, then um, you're doing repetitions, but you're not creating um, uh, mechanical stress enough to create an adaptation for that muscle fiber to get bigger or or longer, um, or the fascicle length to get longer. And then the final bit is muscle damage. So this is the more controversial bit, I suppose, but one of the bits about muscle size is you do need to create muscle damage. Um, so putting all of those things together, you need you have to create stimulus within a training program which attacks increasing muscle size, which is the eights and the tens, and then you need things at the other end, which is to attack the kind of the neuromuscular and the nervous system's ability to to produce force and remove the inhibitions or the things that stop the signal from the brain down to the down to the muscle. So that's why we tend to do okay. volume and then intensity. And then what we would do in the kind of latter parts of this part of the season going into the major champs is that you'd still give a small stimulus of the kind of eights or tens in there, but yeah. you'd have a little bit more exposure, the intensity, maybe fewer sessions uh, within, within the week. And one of the things we know with rowers and endurance sports is when you stop strength training, you the speed at which you lose the force and power characteristics you've developed is rapid. Like within within 12 days, you can lose yeah. 20% of your, your force production um, just by not being exposed to that. So we need to keep that in consistently, which is why I always go, why I... I those who've been unfortunate enough to work with me know that we strength train all the way through as, as long as we can get away with, with strength training. And I've had okay. athletes strength train right away to the eve of the Olympic Games. And I've had people who've been lifting during the Olympic Games as well, yeah. uh, two days before the Olympic <clears throat> final, in fact, to, 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 to do that because that was so important for them to maintain a high force characteristics within their, within their uh, repertoire. Okay. And then what are the session one, two, three, and four? Which sort of exercises were you including? You mentioned squats and deadlifts. Yeah. So and I, yeah, so this this is a bit I I go back and forth having discussions with this. And and one of the things I'll 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 start this with is when you look at my training programs, they look really, really simple. And they are really simple. Um and I get I the reason why I have these discussions about that because people are like, well, I could write that training program. It's like, yeah, you probably could write that training program. But the thinking behind that has gone full circles. I've kind of done it and be more complicated and tried to put more in or less in or whatever. And I've just come back to these are the things I know that work. So from a, um, from a mechanical point of view, the thing I know um, in terms of leg strength is the knee extension produces between 50 and 70% more force and more power than the hips during the rowing dry phase. So the knee extension is far more important than hip extension during the rowing stroke. So which which is why we put a much more knee dominant based activities, which is why I like squatting more than potentially deadlifting um, in, in the training program. We still have deadlifting um, because it's obviously there is a hip extension, but it and it does have knee 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 extension in there. But when I've looked at all of the um, all of the um, uh, biomechanical data that that I've had available um, had available the raw data through some of the PhDs that work with British rowing, every single time I've I've tested that knee extension becomes the predominant uh, force producer or power producer during the dry phase. So from catch to maximum handle force or catch to end of end of end of um, um, knee full extension and the reason we 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 um that that's important to understand because that has a massive in, uh, massive um impact on exercise selection so which is why squats important so we'll we'll do squatting we'll have deadlifting in there leg press is staple so we always have the rowers leg pressing um if rowers are lumbar spine compromised and a lot of them are because of their you're not a row unless you've had low back pain um so if you've got indiscriminate back pain and squatting um or deadlifting is um slightly 
slightly challenging for you, um, then we'll um, then we'll find an find an alternative, but to return you back to those back to those exercises, and that's the important bit. Um, Where's I going with that? So the so those would be the low, lower body exercises. We might put hip thrusts in there as well. Now split squat. When, we, when we're looking at exercise, sorry, split squat at all? What? Just thinking, that, yeah. The reason, the reason we we do, but the, the, this comes down to the real principles. So if we go back to how much does a knee need to, um, how much force does a knee produce during a rowing stroke? So we know it produces. Um, around roughly about a thousand a thousand newtons uh, of force and that's that's one knee so that's about roughly 100 kilos so if that's what it's doing 240 times in a race where is it going to get 100 kilos of load in a gym that's that would be the bit i would okay i would go go after so so one of my things would would, would be is we also know that the, the max force it can produce at the beginning of the race is around 140 to 100, well, sorry, about 12 to 1500 newtons of, of force, which is about 120 to 150 uh, kilos. Where in the gym is is you're going to get 120 to 150 kilos of, of force through, through there? So if you're going to do split squat, then my the, the principles that we have it has to be at 65 percent of what the bilateral equivalent or the two legged equivalent is. So if you can do 100 kilos on a back squat. Then you'd need to do a split squat 65. That would be our, our marker. Otherwise, you're not developing maximal strength. You're developing work capacity or something else. It's just not enough load because you can load the um, the knee extensors on a double leg exercise greater per leg than you can on a on a on a, on a single leg exercise. And I, the reason we got this got this far is that when you when we looked at a lot of the testing on two legs and one legs. What a single leg can produce is between 62 and 67 percent of what it can do on on both legs, which seems odd that it, it's not 50 percent, but it's mm -hmm. about 62 to 67 percent of what they can do. So when you apply that within the in the strength training environment, then we need to find exercises which can you can work at 62 to 67 percent. So we just stuck at 65 percent. That's where you're. That's where you need to be uh, working at for us to have confidence. And we're not. It's not. It's not binary that it's definitely doing it, but it gives us more confidence that if you're working at 65% of the two leg equivalent, you are developing maximal strength. And this is often one of the things that where strength training programs really fail is that if the knee extensor needs to produce, I don't know, 65 kilos of force or 65 kilos of weight or 650 newtons of force around the knee, but the rower can only squat 40 kilos because their, their back stops them from doing that. Their back is working at 100% of its maximal capacity. The knee extensors are working at you know, sort of 60% of its maximal capacity. So if it's only working at 60% of what it can actually do, what does that exercise actually give the knee or the knee extensors? Well, not very much. It's overloading the back rather than the, than the knee. So that's one of the things that we, when I talk about the biomechanical stuff mm -hmm. at the beginning, becomes really important. The exercise selection is one about overloading the, 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 the I call it habitual capability. What can they habitually do around that joint in their event themselves? So throwing, I've said, you know, needs to produce about 150 newtons of, uh, sorry, 150 kilos of load around the knee. In a change of direction for a, for a, for a footballer, they're putting maybe five times their body weight through a change of direction. How are they going to put five times their body weight through a change of direction in the weight room? Because if you can't, then how you're actually creating physiological change and it's just more garbage repetition so i've become much more what's the word um uh uh forthright in some of the things that i do now with, with training programs if it doesn't create the physiological adaptation i need then it doesn't get done in the program okay we have to find an alternative way to do that so all the rowers will have squat or deadlift in we have leg pressing in a staple. Upper body is push and pull. So some some of the interesting stuff with push and pull as well that consistently over the last 20 years in, in or 15 years within the rowing that I've worked with, those who have the biggest bench pull have the biggest differentiation between their bench press, i.e. their bench press mm -hmm. is significantly bigger than their bench pull. Okay. There Just quickly to jump with, with bench pulls, <clears throat> a lot of people don't have access to a bench pull. Lots of gyms don't have them. 
Um, can you think of the best alternative? Bent forward row. Yeah. So seat, seated rows are a staple in our in our program, and those who those who want to improve their pulling performance, I often will get them to do bent over rows. Sorry, seated rows, bent over rows as as supplementary exercise, um, as as a way of of of, of properly overload of overloading that. And if I'm honest, I prefer seated rows and bent over rows more than bench pull, but there's a historical need to keep bench pull in the training program um, for whatever reason. Um, and you know, one of the things I try and try and do is when we have four strength sessions a week, we don't bench pull four times a week. We might at max bench pull twice a week, but normally it's once a week. And primarily because of that, a reason for that is rib stress injuries and back injury. Okay. Now, there's this thing called a com- called a compression ring. So these, these are your ribs. This is your back here. Your ribs are attached to here. When you pull, your ribs kind of go like that. And that creates more stress across your chest wall against your lumbar spine. And then with, with the compression of lying on the bench, it, it, it increases um it increases that load for the for the ribs and the, and the stress stress fractures uh, the stress fractures can increase across uh, across that so i try and reduce the amount of loading through the um uh through the ribs um just give me a second you all right girls yeah no worries uh probably about half hour 40 minutes in a bit uh sorry there's girls yeah girls no worries um um so yeah the Amount of loading through the so ribs. The, yeah, so the ribs, the ribs loading. What, what it, when you're rowing, yeah, that that compression happens when you're r- pulling anything. That that happens when you've got a bench press. You have compression, and then you have of the bench leaning against you, and then you've got that that that, that squeezing of it. So that increases the the, the stress around the, um, the 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 chest wall and the. Um, uh, what you call it, the, the the number spine and the and the mid the thoracic spine. So I try to reduce that as much as possible. So that's why we kind of minimise the amount of bench pull that we have in the training program, okay. and we try to use more more um, other pulling based exercises. But interestingly, the bit for me, which is why bench press and pushing exercises, I think are really important, are because when you're lowering the bar on the bench press, you're getting eccentric load through all the musculature. That you're um, loading, if as if you were bench pulling or or seated rowing, and, it, and one one of the things we know about eccentric loading is that the amount of load you can tolerate is greater um, at an eccentric load than than you can on a concentric, which is kind of eccentric is muscle lengthening, concentric is muscle shortening. So if you can load heavier on the eccentric portion, which is the downward phase of a bench press, then we know we can load your um, your lats particularly your lats um, more effectively and that will have a transfer into into your pulling performance which is why i say you know you've got a 150 bench press you might have a 130 bench pull if you've got a 115 to 110 bench pull maybe 120 bench pull your bench press is probably going to be roughly the same and if you've got anything below 100 kilos in a bench pull i would imagine your bench press is probably between 60 and 90 kilos um, for a male and we'd class them as Weak okay. rowers, mid rowers, strong rowers, and if you want to get a better pull, you need to get a better press because because of that lap dorsi involvement. Which is why when coaches come to me and say I want to get better pulling, it's like right, let's do pressing, and they're like why? Well, because we know we can load the lats more effectively, and we can avoid that compression of the um, of the ribs to, um, in that way a, a little bit better. So that's a really important gotcha. factor okay. to avoid it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, like, yeah. That makes sense. I don't know if that made sense or not. I was just talking a, a load of words at you. No. Yeah. No. It's it's given like a really good um understanding. The big thing is is the why behind it and like why you you want to approach these lifts in, in that way. So, I think yeah, like understanding the reasons behind things just allows for for so much buy in. One thing that w- would be good. Again, I don't want, conscious that we're um getting close to time here. I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, one thing that would be good to do is kind of I, I feel like that's like the experienced rower, um, you know, maybe more towards the elite level. How how would you go about suggesting generally 
someone, maybe they've done a bit of strength training here and there. They've been involved in a gym. Maybe they did a bit of it 20 years ago at college or something like that. And they're maybe a bit older now. Um, how would you go about recommending they start to bring strength training in into their into their training program? Say starting off, and, and like, again, just for context as well, often people, it, it's an access of, they, they may have some dumbbells and a barbell either at their home gym or at their club gym. Um, so how would you go about kind of intro program for them? Yeah, I think the, the two big things for me on this, um, one is consistency. So as, I, as I've mm -hmm. already said, over four years, we made a 30% improvement across all programs. Now that show and that that's because there was consistently loading throughout the week, every week for for within the preseason and season, with four weeks off for the, for the off season. So if you can be consistent with it, you're gonna you're gonna make make changes. Now you're not gonna make changes in a single session or a couple of weeks of doing it. So you are gonna need to keep that that going um, and I regularly and i'll be saying minimum two weeks t twice a week with no more than eight days between the session I want, so if you finish if you did your monday tuesday weight sessions for instance you couldn't leave it till wednesday the next week you'd have to come back on the sunday or monday to make sure that you've got your um your your exposure in there so that'd be my first point the second point would be that our biggest um our biggest uh factor that's going to stop us from doing this is our memory of what we used to be able to do um and i say that with the greatest respect because i i, I it's exactly where i am right now it's like well if i used to be able to deadlift 240 kilos i'll just go and go and do that and realize that 90 kilos is probably a better starting point um so i just temper yourself with what you used to be able to do you may be able to get back there but your goal is about progressing from where you are not to where you where you were um so temper that and then the, the third bit i would say is it's always worth starting below your um below what you're capable of doing at any point now we have a business called um uh, ready to run which is helping runners to return back to back to training oh sorry return back to training to so remain injury free and return mm -hmm. back from, from from injury and when you look at the training program, they start off with like three times eight seconds of calf raises. Now, everyone can do eight seconds of calf raises, but it, it builds a consistency of training in that early stage to start off making it a little bit easier for yourself and get yourself into the into the um, um, into the in, 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 into the rhythm of doing two or three times a week, because if it's hard every single session you go in, it's going to be really difficult to, in, in those in those uh, periods of time to rely on motivation and we know motivation as a behavior um as a behavior wanes and your training will wane when your motivation wanes so routine and consistency of just doing small and regularly for the first four to six weeks will get you into a, into that rhythm and then make small progressions over the 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 the, the um the 12 or 18 weeks afterwards and you will see these big these big progressions so as a starting so point to get that consistently a consistency rather than a runner like how, how could you would you maybe just say starting with like a, a goblet squat for for one exercise yeah, absolutely or... yeah goblet squats or you know even with an empty bar or the dumbbells beside your side you know, anything which just gets you um um just doing stuff and there's there's for me, there's no no reason just to do for the first four weeks just do three sets of ten on everything. So three sets of ten on goblet squats, three sets sets of ten on a uh, bench press or seated row or whatever it is that you're doing. Just and and making sure and we we often use repetitions in reserve, which is a mark of intensity. So if you have a a repetition in reserve of one, that means after you've done ten reps, you could probably do one more. What we want is probably a repetition of reserve of five or six. So you do your 10 reps. And if I ask you to do a few more, you could say, well, I could probably do five or six more. That's about the right. rough intensity you want to get them to. After that first four weeks, it's like, well, let's drop that down to four. We'd still do three sets of 10, but we'll do four repetitions of reserve. So, only, so the weight has to go up a little bit. And the next four weeks down to two. And, and then suddenly you've got 12 weeks of training, 12 weeks of consistency. You've got yourself closer to an intensity where you're getting close to... Where, uh, to a point where you're probably going to have to start thinking about the exercise selection a bit more. Um, and then 
and then and then and then you're there um so it's it's that's where the consistency and patience comes in comes into it because you, people want it in four weeks roughly my experience is when people have detrained and this isn't just within rowing this is across you know 25 years of working with the very best and the the um the people that are just trying to make rowing or running a part of their their life it takes 12 to 16 weeks to get a point where training is normal now and actually that you can only build on um increasing intensity or increasing performance when you've got a solid base of training on you if you try and do that off inconsistent training or too early and the inability to withstand multiple repetitions and sets of exercises you're not going to go anywhere you're going to get injured you're going to burn out you're going to stop because you're demotivated 16 weeks 12 to 16 weeks of three times 10 i know that sounds really blooming boring and it is boring the one thing it will give you it will give your your body work capacity and work capacity is the ability to repeatedly load at maximal sub maximal loading and once you've built off the back end of that then you can push intensity or you can push other things and that would be my 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 um my um uh, go to and not would sorry what am I trying to say that's what I do with everybody regardless of what level you are I want 16 weeks of of, of graft like that and then we'll go afterwards and we'll we'll, we'll progress you from there okay awesome not okay the answer people people necessarily want because it's it's I want one each. session that's gonna get me 50 kilos stronger and take 20 seconds off my 2k please <laughs> When you find that, let me know, and then I'll, I'll subscribe to that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, like, look, yeah, Alex. Like, there's actually so many things that I'd love to keep asking you about, but just yeah, I want to be respectful of your time and also just keep this quite digestible as well. So I think you know, there's so much value that you've given, and already for me, I've got you know so many ideas on, on tweaks and changes that we can maybe look to make to our programming as well, but. I think the highlight for me, especially, was just the the talking about the the mindset going into to weightlifting and the, the big differences there and around culture as well. I think was so valuable. But um, yeah, Alex, so what are you what are you up to to these days? What what's kind of on the calendar? What's um, well, yeah, what are you working on right now? Yeah, the, the, so I still I still work heavily within rowing, and I, I'm a as um, you said at the beginning, I'm a co co owner of. Um, uh, science of rowing so yeah we're, which i've been subscribed to for about two years i think now yeah which yeah oh, great great so science of rowing is very much around translating um science into practical application and my and our job is all my businesses are education or consultancy and for the education bit it's all about making sure you as a coach or a rower can take what we what we provide and apply it within your within your rowing or your mm -hmm. coaching practice the day after. So we've got our second virtual conference, which we're just about to announce uh, online in the next next couple of weeks, which is um, focusing on applied biomechanics and applied physiologists. And the line, I can't share the lineup now, but um, if I do say so myself, it's a brilliant lineup of um, some of the best uh, well-known coaches, some amazing athletes, um, some amazing and very influential researchers who are I must have missed to... I must have missed my invite. Must have gone gone to junk or something. Wow, it's very <laughs> awkward, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and space for one more. Um and then yeah. the um and so the, the, the idea is that day one is physiology and we're gonna show you show you or share with you things that you can do to improve um tracking and monitoring and testing your physiology same with biomechanics on day two things that we know um that you can apply without having to have expensive equipment and so on so um we'll we'll make sure that you 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 and your your um clients and memberships that all have have access to that as well and and, and that will be going out in the next awesome. next few few months uh weeks and then with strength conditioning academy we're, we're you know you know it's a, it's an education around strength conditioning and it's very much focusing on on um providing the ways in which we think which i've just shared with you around outcome and conditions to the wider world and help people really digest what we really want to change and how do we go about making that change and help them kind of digest that and apply that within their in their real real world so 
yeah, we'd love to see some of you uh, uh, at the conference. I'm not sure how interested you are in strength conditioning, but yeah, the conference I think would be uh, an incredible opportunity for you to learn from some of the best in the world. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be there. Um, then also, yeah, you, you've got a couple couple books as well that I'd recommend people checking out. Um, strength and conditioning, uh, strength and conditioning for rowing, and then um, training for the complete rower. Is that right? I- yeah, I don't have my notes right. So yeah, That's two right, books. Yeah. I'll link all this in the bio. I'll also link you know, you know your website and your your social media as well. You're posting on there regularly as as well. And um, yeah, just wanted to to thank you, Alex, for like um for coming on and, and giving us such a valuable insight into the top end of um a massive area of sports in general. So um yeah thank you very much and um yeah we'd certainly like love to have you on uh again at some point in in the future if you wanted to talk s- some of the other areas i know i certainly have got m- m- loads more questions no i check well thanks for inviting me awesome okay cheers